Welcome to the Catalyst Sale Podcast with Mike and Mike. Sales is a thinking process. This podcast will help you learn about what works in sales, how to hone your skills, and increase your success. I'm your host, Jody Mayberry. This week, we have Andrew Savickas as a guest. Andrew is the founder of YieldTalk.com. He does strategy consulting with C-level executives, and he's advised some good startups. Mike, how do you know Andrew? Thanks, Jody. Andrew and I had a chance to work with each other at a previous company where he was the the CEO of the organization. And both Mike and I were with that organization. I'm just excited to have Andrew join the podcast today and share some of his general experience when it comes to sales and marketing and technology professionals kind of coming together and figuring out the best way to build out a high-performing organization, knowing that each of those groups have different needs. So, Andrew, thanks for joining us today. Sure, Mike. I'm thrilled to be here and have a chance to chat with you and the audience. I've been a long-time listener, a first-time guest, so great to be here. Awesome. But the last time we chatted, it was over a hamburger at a bar, and I think it was at lunch, so we weren't just drinking soft drinks and water and that kind of stuff. But so same kind of conversation here. These conversations, we like to keep them pretty casual and and they can go a number of different directions. So why don't we start first with kind of that piece around how, you know, what's, how are salespeople and engineers and marketing folks similar? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think there's a lot of challenges that arise from the, what appear to be, at least on the surface, sort of differences in perspective and vocabulary, I mean, priorities that sort of under the hood you know, really are just surface differences. And, you know, I'm glad to be here in part because I learned so much from my experience working with you in particular, Mike, and Mike Connor as well, about sales and about sales process, the priorities, the way that you think about sales as an organization and as a a thinking process. And that journey for me as a, a CEO coming into an organization that had a sales function, but coming from a background that was primarily largely a a technical orientation, largely a consumer orientation. That side of the business of B2B sales was a learning experience for me. And I think there's a lot of lessons learned the hard way that hopefully we can talk a bit about today that that maybe we can save someone else some of those sort of bumps along the way. But, you know, part of the things I learned about sales professionals and marketing professionals and how they relate to and, and are in fact quite similar to engineers or product developers is thinking about Here's an example. If you go to a foreign country and before you go there, you haven't read up on the etiquette. You don't know how much to tip. You don't know the the standard greetings when you enter a business or you don't know what gestures are interpreted as profanity in that country. There's a good chance you're going to get yourself in a little bit of trouble and it may at least have not the kind of a smooth trip that you would otherwise have if you spent some time ahead understanding how to translate the way you look at the world into the way that the people in that country look at the world. And there's a lot of similarities uh, when it comes to navigating the interface and the relationship between, say, you know, sales land and engineering land. Certainly, at least that was my experience. You know, for example, I know that a lot of people, and I'll count myself in this group, you know, thought about sales in a very monolithic way. A salesperson was a salesperson. You sort of have that Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross sort of impression. And obviously, that, that just doesn't tell the whole story. And it was eye-opening to me as I got the education I did from working with outstanding folks that were on you know, the, you, the team that you were a part of in understanding the real complexity and diversity of roles and relationships. You know, how an account executive was different from an account manager. The differences in understanding what it meant to think about new business development versus mining the base. All those sorts of things. The terminology about the pipeline and the lead flow was a, a real eye-opener in education for me along the way. It's a lot of the stuff that you've covered just fantastically throughout the podcast. And yet, all along the way, I was working to translate the things that I was learning into the the context I already knew, into my sort of home language on the tech side, and was struck by how often there were some real strong similarities. You know, I'll just give one simple example, and that is, is that I came to appreciate how much sales professionals rely on their CRM. Certainly in our organization, it was Salesforce, but there's any number of sort of flavors out there. And I really came to appreciate that was just the center of the universe for a sales professional in terms of monitoring their workflow prioritizing their time, tracking their effort, and of course, perhaps most importantly, keeping an eye on their sort of performance against their targets. And that was such a strong similarity to what I knew about an engineer's workflow when it came to you know, a, a, a ticketing system like a JIRA 
or there's any number of other ones there, where that becomes the sort of center of their universe in terms of understanding their workflow, prioritizing their time, tracking their progress, um, and understanding how the work they do fits into the wider organization. And so you know, that helped me understand how to think and sort of empathize with the perspective and concerns that a sales professional might have about the challenges they were having with their CRM, because I could map that into experiences I had had personally and was much more familiar with to hear an engineer talk about their challenges or frustrations or needs when it came to managing their ticketing system. So that was sort of one example of trying to do that kind of cross-cultural translation. And there were many more along the way. Yeah, and it happens. It happens time and time again. I mean, we would joke in the past, yeah, Mike and I, I think have joked on the podcast before about it. You know, when it comes to the technical stuff or coding, it's all ones and zeros. And it's really not ones and zeros anymore. It's they're actually words that are used. And you know, for us to go in there and start to try to speak like a technologist, it will quickly reveal that we don't know what we're talking about. But if you can empathize with the technologist, with the engineer, with the product person, with the developer, and really get an understanding that at their core, we're all human and we all have a set of goals and objectives and things that are driving behavior. If we can work to understand those, we can start to address the gaps in communication, gaps in technology, gaps in process that sometimes just get in the way. Yeah, absolutely. And having those tools at your disposal to help people make that translation. You know, for, for example, you know, a very common scenario that, that I certainly you know, experienced uh, numerous times is you have a perspective of, well, if we need more revenue this quarter, well, how the sales team can't just sell more, right? You know, it's like, well, can't, you just, can't they just sell more? You just give them more, you know, raise the quota or, or give them more leads, right? And certainly to an extent and for a period, some of that kind of thing can work. Yep. But realistically, as you well know, it doesn't. And in fact, there's a, there's a useful analogy that, that comes out of the technology side from a, a fabulous book called The Mythical Man Month from, from Fred Brooks. It's a classic of, of technology. But the, you know, the sort of metaphor is you know, nine women can't have a baby in a month, right? And there's a lot of similarities there between trying to sort of force a sales organization to achieve certain results without giving them the resources to do that. The same thing happens on the technology side of, you know, you get a perspective of, well, how come we can't have, you know, five more features this month? Can't we just hire more people or can't we just, you know, you know, sort of work harder? And it's the same sort of, you know, constant issue that we have as humans, which is we have a finite amount of attention and a finite amount of resources. And we have to sort of balance what we do to utilize those effectively. And, you know, sort of understanding and empathizing with the same kinds of challenges that may manifest in different ways, but under the surface are, are really quite similar. It's very, very helpful. So what are some of the gaps when it comes to communication and language? Like how, you know, let's say I'm a, I'm a sales pro, I'm working with a client, I have a conversation about something that they need inside their organization. So I come back and I communicate it to product or I come back and I communicate it to engineering or I come back and, and I put it in an email or in a Slack channel and I just deliver it out to the organization. What are some of the things I should be thinking about as a sales pro when I'm gathering that kind of feedback? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, of course, that the specifics are going to vary a lot by the situation. But I, I think first and foremost, it's a frame of mind. So I'm sure you've had the experience sitting down with, you know, whether it's a customer or, or colleagues in an organization who may be engineers or, or designers, and they talk about, you probably cringe a little bit when they talk about sales and sort of paint a very broad brush about what it is and what it does. <laughs> yep. And so, you know, I, I, I'm sure that's the experience has happened. And so the sort of, to sort of flip that um, in the conversations about, you know, a lot of the, the flip side of that is, is sort of labeling everything as IT is a common thing where, you know, well, this sort of, that anything technical is somehow IT. And, and in fact, there's a lot of nuance in what technologists do, how they describe themselves. In the same way, there is a tremendous amount of nuance in how different kinds of sales professionals sort of describe themselves and think about their work. So certainly there are people within the technical part of an organization that know, you know about the internal systems and make sure everyone has the right equipment and keep the servers running. And very rarely are those the same people that do the work to build the software product if that's what your company sells. And often those sort of two camps within the technology team may not always understand each other because they have different priorities. And, and just sort of understanding that there is a lot of variety in people who have 
technical roles or engineering roles well beyond just saying they are engineers or they're IT in the same way that it would be doing a disservice to describe all salespeople as just salespeople. So sort of recognizing that some of the details beyond just that a person was, that there is a, you know, there's a distinction between, for example, in most organizations, someone with a, a CTO or chief technology officer title typically has a very different set of responsibilities and goals as someone with a CIO or chief information officer responsibility. Um, some organizations have one, some have the other, some have both. And certainly, you know, to be fair, there's often some fluidity in how those are described. But as one example, those two things can mean very, very different things. And if you sort of take those two as equivalent, that's probably a mistake. So some of it is, is just a frame of mind and a sort of paying attention to some of the vocabulary and acknowledging that what you hear from a customer or hear from a client in the context of a technology discussion, that person or that perspective that you're hearing probably doesn't cover the entirety of that organization's technology needs or perspectives. That may be the sort of most directly useful piece of that. Yeah. And it really highlights the importance of getting others involved. I mean, so like these are things that you know, for me, not having you know, with this lack of technical background, I wouldn't be able to distinguish between the CTO and the CIO as an example, or the CIO and the CISO and the CTO and what they care about. But I can lean on people inside my organization. I can lean on the experts inside the organization who have that perspective. And I can invite them to a call. I've never been in a situation, or I don't recall a situation where I've tried to get a technical professional on a call or a marketing professional on a call with a customer, and that person has said, no, I just don't want to do it because I don't want to talk to customers. And I think we as sales professionals forget to leverage those resources inside our organization. I couldn't agree more. And I think that is an incredibly powerful tool that helps everyone involved if you can. I mean, of course, you you have to have a framework for preparing someone for the conversation or making sure they understand what the goal of the conversation is and you can keep everything on track. But that can be an incredibly valuable process to have someone, you know, uh, an engineer working on the product, have a chance to spend time talking with and working side by side with the people out there selling it. And perhaps more importantly, the people, you know, using it and buying it. That can be incredibly helpful. And I think it's great. You hear stories of organizations that, you know, one example is there's organizations that, that cycle new employees through customer support, for example, for a period of time. And I think there's a lot of similar sorts of tours of duty that can be done to make sure, you know, you wouldn't want to have someone in the same way. I heard lots of conversations at various sales trainings and sales meetings about the importance of focus and time management for a sales professional, right? And I absolutely get that. You want to make sure people are focused on meeting the results that are put in front of them. And and again, to sort of underscore the similarities, the same is true for someone who's spending their time developing software, for example. It's, It's an incredibly challenging mental process to do that, that that is very prone to, if you get distracted or sidetracked, it can really introduce a lot of delay into that process. And so you want to be careful not to get someone sort of pulled into customer calls. You know, you don't want to have pull them out two or three times a day versus saying, okay, for this day of this week or, you know, this week of this month or whatever it is, you know, you sort of block that out and say, this is your time to go and be the person who can be the liaison you know, with people on the call with customers or, or that sort of thing. I think that's incredibly valuable to do that. And, and looking the other way, the, of course, the, the perhaps fundamental characteristic of technology, especially as we think about it today, is how fast it changes. You know, I think about how much has changed even since, you know, I started my career. And one of the things that has changed quite in a very positive way is how much easier it is and more approachable it is to learn some of these new technologies. There's a lot of new great tools out there, you know, interactive code editors, lots of great, you know, video and text and other sort of delivery mechanisms for learning this stuff, great resources and exercises out there. And I'm hard pressed to think of a function in an organization and and certainly sales is one of them, but I think this applies to marketing, this applies to HR, this applies to almost anyone in the organization. I'm hard pressed to think of anyone in the organization that wouldn't benefit from spending, you know, two or three weeks or, or four weeks going through a basic, you know, process. It doesn't have to be a formal course, but something to get themselves experience coding something and building something using technology. And, and again, they can be quite simple and there's lots of great tools out there, but just to get that empathy and get that exposure and awareness to understand, you know, some of the terminology and some of the different pieces involved, I think is an incredibly valuable investment in time. 
Yeah, there's a the story that comes to mind for me on this is is working with something like Excel. And I know this is going to be pretty remedial, but understanding the importance of building out logic when creating formulas in a tool like Excel and then starting to see how that applies in other contexts. And you know, I think of the kids when they were younger and they were playing a lot of Minecraft, which you said they're building things with a graphical interface. Coding, programming, designing, these are all creative things that, that require logic and are if you go in and try to do some of these things, you can find different ways to incorporate them into the role that you're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Excel because that's a great example of, we think of Excel as a, as a business tool, as an accounting tool, as a spreadsheet. And under the hood, when you do, especially, you know, I, I know you, you do get pretty sophisticated, Mike, with the pivot tables and some of the work you do in Excel, that what you're doing is, is what's known, what's known as functional programming. I mean, that's sort of a buzzword that goes around in software circles about there's a choice between two different sort of philosophies of programming language. There's a imperative programming languages and functional. And I won't get into the specifics, but the reality is Excel is a fantastic example of a functional programming language. And you don't need to know the details of why that is, but it's a reminder that a lot of times the things you're doing to the sort of focus on logic and the problem solving and the, the thinking about accomplishing the goal you're trying to do are exactly the same things that, that people do when they, when they write software. And I'm reminded of, of an experience I had when I was in graduate school and learning accounting, going through the sort of accounting first part of an MBA program is, is accounting and you learn how to do things like journal entries. You learn how to do the mechanics of entering the transactions and, and all the things that the folks in, the, in an organization's accounting team does every day. And it struck me as I was going through this process, the dual entry accounting system, you know, debits and credits and the way the balance sheet balances, what it was ultimately doing is, is as I was going through the exercises and, and you you'd do something wrong and suddenly the numbers wouldn't work, the balance sheet wouldn't balance, yep. the entry wouldn't line up and you knew it was wrong. So you knew there was a problem. And so what I realized I was doing is I was debugging. I, I was debugging the the journal to find the, the bug so that the, you know, the equivalent of the compiler, which was the balance sheet, would work. And so there's a lot of similarities in the, the sort of thought process and thinking mechanism that goes into uh, sorting out a, a, an issue in an accounting journal with the thinking process that goes through you know, debugging a, a glitch in a, in a software program. Yeah, I think the, you know, it just apply thought, right? And go through a thinking process and start to think about the way that each of these components apply inside others. I want to shift gears here a little bit and talk a little bit about some of the things that are happening in the broader market, whether you're talking about consumerization of technology. Some of these are older things like bring your device to work and all of the different ways that technology can integrate into workflow. You're starting to see a, a combination or a transition from organizations who are strictly B2C focused, business to individual consumer focus, and those who are strictly B2B focused, business to business focus, and seeing those kind of come together and see both a B2C and B2B mentality in the design of the organization, the overall objectives, and how that company is going to meet its goals. Can you share some of your experience in that environment? Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. And, and you know, I definitely learned a lot in the organization that we both were a part of was a great sort of laboratory for understanding and learning about that interplay between sort of a consumer orientation and a, and a business orientation. And, and I think there's, there's kind of two waves to think about here. You know, one is the diffusion of technology throughout an organization in terms of people using technology. And this one is, has been underway for some time, of course, but, you know, is, I think is accelerating where it used to be that IT or technology for especially an organization that was not strictly speaking a technology company, so a manufacturer or a financial services company. There was a, an IT department or a technology department or an engineering department, and that was a vertical silo on an organizational chart in many cases. And you know, when there was a need for technology or an interface with technology, that all connected to or sort of funneled through that sort of vertical part of the, the organization. And, and what I think we've seen, especially over the last 10 years, is now technology is not a vertical department, but it is a a sort of horizontal capability that diffuses within the organization. And you see this absolutely within the sales ecosystem. I mean, I I don't have to tell you about the blossoming landscape of sales tech companies, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of various tools and services and products that are 
out there trying to vie for the attention of sales professionals as ways to help them get ahead and, and an edge that there's all of these technologies that are in embedding into the entire workflow of every professional, not just technologists, not just sales professionals. So that's the sort of first wave is everyone as user of the technology. And the second wave that I think is more recent and, and, and I think in some ways more germane to this discussion is in part because everyone is now using technology and especially in their personal lives. So it used to be the computer was the something you did for work. You did your spreadsheets, uh, you did your, your email. And of course, now uh, arguably more people spend, you know, people spend more of their time engaging with technology and electronic devices for personal reasons, media consumption, social media, uh, that sort of thing than they do for their professional lives. And that has made us all experienced and savvy buyers of technology. And so I think that sec- the first wave was more people in the organization as users of technology. And I think what you're seeing now is more people in the organization as discerning buyers of technology and discerning you know, from the perspective of, of expecting the tools they use in their workspace to be as easy and flexible and potentially fun almost um, as the technology they use in their personal lives. And that creates a lot of challenges from a product design perspective, but also from a sort of purchasing and, and workflow perspective of it's going to be a challenge for if you're trying to sell someone a web-based piece of software to not give them the opportunity to try it before they buy it without having to talk to someone. You know, that's, of course, always a tension is you, there's folks who want to have that connection, want to build that contact to have the relationship. But there's a lot of people who just won't, will never get past that hurdle because their expectations are that the way the world works now is that they should have a free trial and they should try something out. And that's going to give them a chance to see how it works the same way they get to try out uh, new apps or, or new things. I mean, I know that introduces a lot of challenges to, to an organization, but I think it's an important change that's well underway. Yeah, it just highlights that importance of a, a comment that's out there. And I, I forget who said it, and so many people have said this, so we'll figure out if we can attribute it to somebody. But it's the, that whole idea of the buyer has already informed an opinion on the organization or on the product before you're engaging with them. So gone are the days of you being the person who's educating them on what's new and why this works and how it's going to solve the problem. It's more about facilitating their buying process or helping them navigate the buying process than out there always pitching, which is you know, a challenge that we see in many of these early stage companies. Now, you've had a chance to work with a number of early stage organizations. Can you talk about some of the common challenges that you've seen in these organizations and, and you know, some advice that you might be able to share on how they can, can address those, those ideas and those concepts? Sure, sure. There are, are sort of two quite related things that I, I've, I've seen enough times to know that there's a pattern here. You know, one sort of gets to what we talked about earlier, where let's say you get, you get an organization that may, may start with a very technical team building a product and initially aiming it at individual users and perhaps seeing some, some adoption and some traction. And then that organization starts to, in part, you know, perhaps unintentionally, discovers that that product has appeal uh, in an organizational context where they, want to, uh, they may start selling the product to individual consumers. And in turn, someone comes back to them and says, this is great. I would like this for my entire team or entire organization. And that may not be something that the company had really thought through. And you know, one of the things that happens is sort of what we talked about earlier, where someone says, well, I guess we need a sales team or I guess we need a salesperson. And what they do is they sort of go out there, put an ad on Craigslist for a salesperson and, and hire the first person that comes in who had you know, worked at HubSpot or something like that. And you know, without, uh, that's a simplification, but, but I, you know, I, I think I'm not too far off of some real life stories that I've heard that inevitably just don't work out right. um, because people aren't thinking about it strategically and don't know the skill set that they need based on where they are, what kind of customers they're trying to do and where they're trying to go. And, you know, further downstream, maybe they get through that sort of hurdle, but then tends to be a challenge with, with the very different timelines and expectations in dealing with individual customers um, versus institutional buyers. And you get a company that has been operating on a certain cadence with a product for individuals finds very quickly that an institution that's thinking about writing a six-figure check or you know, signing a large deal, you know, that kind of revenue, especially coming in a big chunk, can be very appealing to a company that's you know, thinking very carefully about their runway and their burn rate. 
And yet, without some real care, that can turn into a very significant time sink for an organization. Um, They can spend a lot of time and energy doing demos and doing meetings and doing trips and trying to quickly make feature request changes and really re-organizing, trying to get their organization to meet this potential customer's need. And without necessarily understanding a realistic picture of the likelihood of success of that kind of effort, I think something that another piece of the puzzle when it comes to folks with a a more technical background understanding the sales process and the the sales cycle is, you know, just how driven it is by that notion of probability. And, you know, you talked about ones and zeros, but that that sales is, is not as binary as it appears to be. It's not that you make the sale or you don't. It's really a function of having a pipeline that in aggregate will generate a certain percentage of the dollars that you think are associated with those opportunities. And really understanding that is, it sounds simple, but is a huge mental shift in understanding the way sales really works. And you understand that it's not just thinking about, well, what did it take me to get this first B2B deal closed? It's what's it going to take organizationally to build the process and build the team that's going to take to do the volume of pipeline that we need to meet our revenue objectives? And what's it going to take to then fill that pipeline with leads and opportunities? And there's a ton of stuff in there that I know you guys do a lot with Catalyst that is just totally new information for a lot of these small companies and startups. And the ones that can sort of get that education and get that experience and expertise early on, I think are in much better shape. Yeah. And the ones who do this well, the ones who who have the ability to do both the B2C side of the equation and the B2B side of the equation and have the have a data over a long period of time related to both audiences can start to look at B2C as a leading indicator of for B2B. I know that we experienced that in the previous organization. If we started to see things trend down on the B2C side, it would raise awareness or to help us to be more mindful of potential risk on the B2B side downstream. And usually it was a number of months downstream, but B2C was certainly a leading indicator for us. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that interplay is super important. And a a very common, uh, another pattern here that you see on that relationship is a company focuses on on B2C. And one of the characteristics of a consumer product and a consumer business is typically, especially in the subscription model or recurring revenue model, is churn. And again, getting back to the probability side of it, what churn ends up meaning is, is you know, every month or every year, depending on your billing cycle, generally consistent percentage of customers don't renew. And you know, that varies a lot by industry and product, of course. But you know, as an example, let's say every month or every year, you're going to lose 5% of your customer base. And that percentage generally, you know, certainly is my experience, doesn't really change all that much over time. But what that means is as the base gets bigger, the amount of people you lose every month or every year gets bigger too. And unless you're going to keep spending more and more and more and more to refill uh, that pool, you're going to be in some trouble. You're going to reach a steady state. As soon as your new customers coming in is equal to your new customers going out, then it's going to level off and the growth is going to go away. And that's another sort of transition point when organizations often say, oh, well, I guess we need to go pivot to B2B. But again, without thinking that through very carefully, then they're going to be in for some, some nasty surprises. And the other way is, I think, as you pointed out, uh, monitoring that B2C base to see, well, are renewals going, you know, is, is there a trend where people are renewing at a, at a worse than expected rate? Well, that's a problem. That, and that's going to manifest itself down the road uh, with some of those larger B2B customers. Um, and I think that's, that's a sort of really important relationship to keep between them. And then the other piece of it is that I, I think we saw in the business we worked with together on is you can think about a consumer audience as an audience in and of itself and as a market in and of itself. And that's great, but you're going to be more effective and I think get better results if you think about it in two other really important ways. One is as the leading indicator that you just described, where you can watch behavior there and get insight into how your institutional buyers might behave down the road. And the other is thinking about that consumer audience as a fantastic source of leads and opportunities for your B2B base and how some of the best you know, evangelists that you're going to get are ones who, who use and often pay for the product themselves, who end up being tremendously valuable as evangelists and partners in helping you sell something that's much larger to a wider organization. Yeah, it's amazing the raving fans that you can find inside that group, especially those who are willing to invest their own dollars in a resource that makes an impact on what they're doing. 
one of the books you turned me on to early on was a book business. And there's a number of correlations between the period of transition in the publishing space when you talk about going from hardcover to paperback and the disruption that took place there that apply to other spaces that we're seeing and disruption that we're seeing in other markets. Can you share just either some personal experience or some reasons why you recommended a book like that and why that's interesting? Sure. That's a great question. Yeah, the book is a book business, past, present, and future. It was written by uh, Jason Epstein, who was a, a very famous in the sort of New York editorial literary scene uh, for a very long time. And, you know, I, I remember sending it to you because, you know, I, I think just as I was, I was gaining a lot of sort of cultural competency around B2B sales and especially the kind of ed tech ecosystem that we were working in, I was trying to find sort of translation guides I could share with folks in the organization to help them navigate what in that business was an important supplier network around the publishing landscape. Another reason is I am a a big fan of trying to think about technology with a very historical lens. My undergraduate work was in media studies, and a lot of that was the history of communications and the technology around communications. And so one example is I remember reading a lot about the origin and the dawn of the telegraph, which we think a lot about the internet, but in many ways, the telegraph had at least as transformative, if not more transformative, an impact on our country and our economy as the internet has. You know, it was for the first time, communication and transportation were separate. You know, previously, if you wanted to send a message, you had to send the message physically, whether it was by horse or by train or or other sort of means. Um, So this was, this separated time and space in a way that that hadn't happened before. And that was, that was very profound. And the other sort of side of that is that, you know, there's a great quote, I think it's, uh, it's Alan Kay, perhaps, you know, the technology is, is anything that was invented after you were born, right? We don't think about often the stuff that we use every day that is just as much a technology as our cell phone. You know, we don't think about the book as a technology, but of course it is. You know, the, the, the hyphen was a piece of technology invented in, you know, in Germany in, 13, in the 1300s, and it took 300 years for the hyphen to reach England, right? I mean, punctuation, page numbering, uh, the space between words, these are all technological innovations in the context of information and communication. And making sure that we always keep that in mind that, you know, we talk about innovation and transformation and technology, but we've been doing this for a very long time. And you can argue that the pace is changing uh, and, and accelerating, but there's not a lot a fundamental difference between innovation when it comes to artificial intelligence and sort of the, the inevitable cyclical nature of, of what happens to industries and companies that, than you, you would have thinking about the transition from you know, steamships to, to railways. There's a, a great book by Carlotta Perez called Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital. And in it, she lays out this fantastic framework for understanding technical innovation and the influence it has, not just on on companies, but on our entire economy in these you know, 50, 60 year waves, you know, starting with the industrial revolution and moving all the way through the present day. And having that historical perspective, that historical lens is, I think, super valuable for keeping the right perspective on what's happening. And that's you know, something I got in understanding and learning more about the history of the publishing industry at a time when we were dealing with the proliferation of ebooks and mobile reading and have found that very valuable in thinking more widely in terms of the impact of technological change. So the one thing that's constant is change, and this will continue to happen. And I think that, that phrase of that, that you, or the quote from Kay that you'd mentioned as far as uh, you know, technology is the thing that happens after you are born. There are many of these instances that we can all go back to, and I, I think the, we'll include some links to various books and reading that are important to both Andrew and and some that, uh, that I've come across that, that I found interesting around this idea and, and this concept. Disruption will always occur. It's a matter of what you do with it and what you learn from others who've gone through it before. Well, Andrew, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Where can people find out more about what you're doing and connect with you if, if they'd like to do so? Sure, sure. Yes. The best place to find me right now is yieldtalk.com. That's an investor education and resource site covering the incredibly fascinating ecosystem around 
investment, crowdfunding, and online alternative investing. I think there's a lot happening there. Speaking of technological change, that is worth taking a look at. And that's where people can find me right now. Andrew, thank you so much. I always feel a little bit like Mike steals my thunder when he asks, where can we find out more about you? But we just deal with that. Thanks for this great interview and helping us learn. And and I look forward to finding out more about what you're up to and keeping up with you. If you want to find out more about Catalyst Sale or hear past episodes of the show, you can visit CatalystSale.com. There you can find the whole catalog of episodes we've done so far. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, I think is what they call it now, or Stitcher Radio. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you, Mike. And thank you for listening to the Catalyst Sale Podcast. Podcast.